I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about, I think, a comment, you know, and I'll give you another case that's really on my mind, and I'm curious to hear how all of you guys <clears throat> would solve this. So I have a 30-year-old woman who um, had triple negative breast cancer that was metastatic at diagnosis, and she actually had, um, uh, she had liver metastases. And so we gave her uh, st our standard therapy, actually, because we found the liver metastases as we were starting to give her the therapy. I don't know how this happened, but the bottom line is she got our standard, which in our group um, uh, is four cycles of uh, adromycin and cytoxin, uh, followed by weekly pacotaxel for 12, and we just continue the weekly pacotaxel. And she's had, she had a complete response to all Lucky of her therapy. Her. Complete. <laughs> and she had disease in her breast. She had a fairly large tumor in her breast. We started as neoadjuvant therapy. So she had probably like a three or four centimeter, four centimeter tumor. It's gone. And almost all of her metastatic disease is gone. Okay? So now it's, two, it's a year later, a year, year and a half later. She comes to me and she says, Dr. Brusky, I want to have surgery on my breasts. Okay? I want to have a bilateral mastectomy. Is she still on the paclitaxel? Or? No, we stopped the paclitaxel. She's off so everything. She's been now. off of everything. Off for everything a year. for about six months. About six months or so. So off everything. Complete response. Near complete response. Maybe a little bit of, you know, haziness. You can never tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but she's clearly had a complete response. But uh, so just to bring up, so you decided to stop everything, right? Because you know, there's a number uh, of trials. I know. <laughs> that was a whole other show. I mean, and let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, before we even get to the question, I wanted to really bring Terry in on. You know, the issue here now is number one: do you stop the therapy because there is some limited data that's been floating? Quite a lot of data. There's really a lot of data. Yeah, what we're talking is. about is continuing therapy versus stopping. There's so tell a, me what the data, what is so the data? So there were two randomized trials in the old days before we had, you know, taxanes and all the different options we have now in the metastatic setting showing improved survival if you continued therapy versus stopping, which is where that sort of maintenance versus transplant uh, trials were developed. And then there was a very recent phase three trial from the Korean group. Right, that's what I was thinking about. And that's actually a very well done study. Uh, the thing they did which is quite different from the US and European approach is that if you had ER positive or ER negative disease, you got your chemo. If you responded, you were randomized to maintenance chemo or nothing. But you know, I would give hormone therapy, right? right. So what they found was that, uh, and in fact, they use more chemo earlier than we do also, right, for ER positive disease. What they found was that in in triple negative patients, there was a difference in survival. So that's what's really motivated me. On the other hand, the patients say to you, and I just had a patient say this to me yesterday, but I don't want to continue the chemotherapy. Right, I'm tired, <laughs> I have neuropathy yeah. or something, you know, right. So, so I mean, so you so say this. This woman is different case, however. Right, so you have a woman who's had a great, whatever the systemic therapy you give her is. I mean, we're now in an era, you know, where people do pretty well. We select them properly a little better than we used to. Our therapies are better. You're going to have a lot of women now who present with metastatic disease with a primary breast lesion who now come to you. I'm sure everybody has one of these in our practice, or many. You know, what do you do? What do you say to them? And before we get to the surgeon, let me ask the medical oh, oncologist yeah. <laughs> first before we do get to the surgeon. I'm really curious to see what they How said. old is she this patient? Uh, 30. She's 30 years old. I will say that one thing that's different about her is I don't have a lot of patients like this. She is quite unique. And in fact, the uh, I think that there is actually a lot of... Uh, interest in studying these patients more, the uh, and they're called the what, yeah, exceptional. the exceptional, exceptional respond responders. Right. Yep. Because I don't have a lot of patients with triple negative disease who get a CR and then hang tight for six months. Right. So she is unique, and in that situation, if a patient says to you, "Look, I, I just don't want to think about this breast cancer anymore," we explain we don't think it's going to affect her survival, but also I'm not going to say to her you can't do that surgery. So. Right. I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, the problem is we, until recently, did not have any prospective randomized studies to really tell us how to manage the breast in somebody who's had a CR or good response for metastatic disease. There was a lot of retrospective analyses suggesting a survival benefit, but, you know, obviously fraught with um, selection bias. Even when they statistically correct for that selection bias, there did appear to be a survival benefit. In her, I would discuss, just like Hope, discuss the pros and cons. I wouldn't recommend a mastectomy or radiation, which is all the way to one end, um, but I would consider a lumpectomy or limited surgery that would not, um, you know, put her in harm's way too much. I don't know. What do you... What do you think in your practice? I, I, 
I think I would, uh, if she came to me and she said she wanted to have a mastectomy, uh, I, this is a person that, that will recur. This is a person that will die of the disease. This is a person that, that will eventually need more chemotherapy. If um, uh, I would you know, present her at a tumor board, because again, like Dr. Rugo said, this is very unique, a 30-year-old who presented with liver metastases and a complete response. And I think even at a tumor board, we would get uh, different opinions. I, I probably would... Uh, not, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't discourage her from seeing the breast surgeon, but I, I certainly wouldn't encourage her from having a mastectomy because she a, will recur. So now we have yeah. all the medical oncologists. Finally, we did. We yeah. sent her to the surgeon, and that was the surgeon <laughs> saying. That's the so, question. Yeah, I mean, I think that what has been said. I think I would repeat most of what's been said that um, before the randomized trials that showed really no benefit from adding surgery, uh, the. Retrospective data has shown that if you have surgery, you do better. The question is who has surgery and who doesn't, and there's a big selection bias in who has surgery. Those that probably we don't know they have metastatic disease and then we find out, um, or those that have limited disease versus those that have very extensive disease. So it's impossible to control for any statistical, uh, in, in any valid statistical way on that. And I, I think the randomized trials, two of them have shown no significant benefit. There are others, though, that have been, uh, they're ongoing and it will be completed that will address this issue. Well, that's the real question. The two randomized trials that we keep talking about, one was done in Turkey, one was done in India, in India. where the systemic therapy really isn't as good or as aggressive, you know, hope to say. The, they're not as aggressive yeah. in, in Korea in the, certain in the, ways that we The are. Indian study was, uh, yeah, they didn't have receptive for the positives, but uh, the Turkey study, I think, had pretty good systemic therapy. So you're happy with the Turkish data? I think I was okay, yeah. And there was a little bit of, of a trend, but no, nothing really significant. The, the bottom line, though, in this particular patient is that I would probably not do a bilateral mastectomy. Now, this patient, the only thing is, did you check to see if she has BRCA mutation? She does not. She does not. Uh, so because, I mean, prof bilateral mastectomy is a big procedure that eventually you do with somebody that you have a long-term life expectancy where you can prevent second primary cancers. And that's not clearly the case here unless right. you run into this very exceptional response. But if the patient is interested in having a lumpectomy where he doesn't want to fill the tumor in the breast or she's worried about it, I think it's a minimal surgery and I will do it. And sometimes, not this particular patient because there's liver meds, but somebody else that has like one bone med or two bone meds, then we're talking about oligometastatic disease. And in these cases, sometimes we'll do surgery for a curative intent. So we will do radio, uh, stereotactic radio surgery for the bone med or two bone meds or uh, so. But there's a different sort of approach there. The, the approach is that maybe we can cure some of these patients or at least improve their, their progression-free survival. Uh, in which case, I would do a lumpectomy and I would do center node, make sure that we clear the disease, and then I would radiate the breast in, in that case. But bilateral mastectomy is a, it's a, it's a big proposition for somebody like that. It's incredibly important what you say, though, because you know we see these people who need treatment, need a brain MRI, they get a headache. You know, the first right. thing you want to do is brain MRI. Oh, they have an expander in with metal. Right. They can't have their right. brain MRI. Right. So this is not a decision to be taken lightly. But uh, did you consider liver-directed therapy, since we're talking we about- We did, I sent her to the liver, yeah. We did and you know but basically a lot of our disease is done I mean so you know you can't find anything can't find direct. anything and we have very good we have at our institution we have tremendous liver surgeons and you know I sent her there and they said there's nothing there's nothing to do yeah. well let me ask this have you ever seen as oncologist anybody that actually gets cured with triple negative disease and liver meds after the initial chemotherapy I think I see it more and we'll talk about this in a minute more with the herd not cured yeah, but long-term non-progressors probably with her two disease more than I haven't you with know, her two disease more than triple negative certainly the triple negative they they they, they progress and and uh, I've never seen anyone cured so we, you know you can you know occasionally get these patients over long long times right. who sit around so I currently have two patients in my practice who have triple negative disease had visceral disease that was treated and in one case resected, even a brain met was resected, and is sitting around for her fourth year this July without any treatment, NED. So I don't think any of these people are cured, but there are unusual, exceptional responders, and so maybe then, this woman is. You, you have know? to think to yourself, if, if triple negative disease is fast growing and you know big tumors sits there for four years, Something has changed. Something has because changed. Because usually, it, you see sometimes with those that have local recurrences and you radiate, you give them some chemo, and they have been recurring like at an interval of three to four months, and then now you go for a year, a year and a half. Something has changed because the disease can simply won't stay there 
or it's or it's a or it's AR positive. It's androceptor positive. It's a different no, subtype of no. negative disease. What I'm saying is like somebody that was recurring in front of your eyes and they oh, have like case like this, like it recurs every ones. three months, and finally we change cool. something. We give another course of radiation with some radiosensitizing chemotherapy, and then all of a sudden we we'll go for a year and a half. Right. That's a good sign that something you know, something has changed. Something, something has changed. Maybe it's the host it's a, response. Right. Or and I think that's really yeah. important. I think the host response is something that we've. I mean, I could talk the whole time and manipulate, monopolize, but that's something I've really started to think about, is really kind of thinking about the host, thinking about the host genetics. You know, we've, we've spent so much time over the last 30 years thinking about the genetics of the tumor, and really haven't focused that much on the genetics and the characteristics of the host, you know, and your host response to, to an insult like this, to cancer. I think the neoadjuvant studies are giving us some really important clues, right? So now more of the neoadjuvant studies are showing that Patients who have tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in the tumor bed have a very good, you know, prognosis or much better survival compared to those who don't. And I have a similar patient as Hopes, who's triple negative um, patient who did not have visceral metastases, but tons of mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes. And she had a, uh, a CR with taxane platinum combination and went two years with no chemo, and I put her on our vaccine trial. And she did beautifully um, for another one and a half years until having a solitary brain met. But again, we're close to four, four and a half years now without it coming back. And is her immune system particularly um, good at protecting her? We, so. Again, we, if by studying these exceptional responders, yeah. may, the host piece of it, maybe we'll know. We won't have statistical validity in anything we do, and that's going to be the problem. We're not going to have a lot of these people, but on the other hand, I think it's a really important point. And I, th I think what Dr. Herwood said is very important, putting these young patients, especially young patients, on clinical trials. We, we keep forgetting that you put the patient on a vaccine trial, um, and I think this is, we really should encourage patients to go on trials. I said to the patient who's four years out, if you'd only gone on to a vaccine trial, that would have been the reason right. why you were so low. Exactly. She appreciated the vaccine. <laughs> All right.